Okay, it's 9 a.m. Thursday, July 18th, 2019. I can't find the camera, so I'm making an audio recording of this human action study guide, um, chapter 17. And it's been a few weeks, it's been like since Porkfest, and we missed a bunch of weeks, so I'm just getting like back into it, and I don't even know where we left off. Um, I think it was number seven was the last one we did, or, okay. um, yeah, I believe so. So, this chapter is all about indirect exchange. Mm -hmm. So we went through media of exchange and money, observations on some widespread errors, Three, demand for money and supply of money. Four, the determination of the purchasing power of money. Five, the problem of human mill and the driving force of money. Six, cash-induced and goods-induced changes in purchasing power. Seven, monetary calculation and changes in purchasing power. I think this was... I So I started rereading like from the beginning just to refresh myself. Me too. And I took a screenshot of a part that I thought was really important, and I wanted to play it back. Okay. And then maybe talk about it for a little bit. That would be great. This is from the beginning? It's about 45 minutes into, so I'm not sure exactly which section it was, but... All right. really thought it pertained... This section seemed to have a lot to do with Bitcoin. To yeah. Me. It was it like... Was, yeah. saying like a good needs um, industrial use or to become money at some point at least at the beginning right presumably uh, an item could be used industrially yeah. at some point right. and then later traded only as money so at some point we're gonna get to the stage where everyone needs new money because um, the current monetary system is going to fade away and so the history of the value of money is kind of kind of disappeared with the value of the dollar inflating it sounds like what you're saying is uh, when Mises says we'll have to begin the process anew uh, when like a, a monetary instrument no longer is is usable for mm -hmm. some reason. Right. You have to start again with um, finding a, a medium of exchange that is the most tradable good. Right. And so I, I, I don't think that Bitcoin or BTC, and actually any crypto, exists still outside of the current monetary system we have because it's so subject to new dollars coming in mm -hmm. and the 
it's kind of how people gauge its success and failure is based on this old like legacy system that's influencing it mm-hmm. so if there's going to be a, truly a, a new re- a reset then all the history is going to go away like you can't you can't judge that bitcoin is ten thousand dollars because what is ten thousand dollars like it, it that history is away gone away it becomes meaningless. Yeah, so then we go into the system where Mises talks about it has to have, like, the money that is going to emerge from, like, this, this rubble is going to be the goods that are used as utility. And then through that, through the demand that people are going to want it, then it's going to be start using as a medium of exchange and the demand will increase. Yeah. The most money is by definition mm-hmm. the most tradable good. Mm-hmm. And it seems like right now what we call Bitcoin is a medium of exchange mostly for other fiat money. Mm-hmm. So people don't buy goods and services with Bitcoin as much as they buy other fiat money with right. it. So it's a medium of exchange uh, that its utility is to get in and out of fiat money. Yeah, and so if and it, the whole value proposition on Bitcoin is that the fiat money is no good. So it's it's as if like it it's doomed because people aren't going to want fiat anymore. So why would they? be using this Bitcoin to trade in that fiat. That's the only thing people are using it for. Why do you assume, and I'm not saying you're wrong, but why do you assume that people will not want fiat anymore? Because I think it will lose a lot of its purchasing power in the future noticeably to other assets and people will get fed up of not being able to save wealth Mm -hmm. holding fiat and I'm willing to bet there will be more regulations in the future than there are now that makes it even harder to move your fiat I don't see regulations getting cut. I see, you know, the government always getting bigger. It sounds like what you're saying is um, the money will lose some of its utility as a medium of exchange Mm -hmm. because people won't be able to um, expect the same purchasing power with it and um, when they trade it Mm -hmm. for goods and services, they... Uh, we'll find that the money is, is not uh, uh, effective. Yeah, I think we're moving to more and more towards like e-dollars, where it's all electronic money and electronic dollars. And once there's that, then you can go to like negative interest rates and all these crazy things. Uh, yeah, it's what Mises calls it um, checkbook money. Mm-hmm. I think that that's definitely the trend and I don't see um, a sign of the trend stopping Macy says in this chapter that when banks put out um, give credit to a person's bank account they withdraw it immediately because they're like we don't know if this is good or not so we're, we're taking the money mm-hmm um, and that puts a limit on how much the banks can give in terms of credit because they don't want to just give their whole bank away. Um, but that's that's uh, that's not possible with with Bitcoin, as far as I know. Yeah. Maybe it is. Um, I guess people can do Bitcoin on leverage, so there there is a way to credit people Bitcoin they don't have. Mm-hmm. So maybe I'm wrong there. But anyway, uh, that, was, that was a really interesting um, excerpt 
Was there anything else that stood out to you about it that you wanted to bring up? Um, no, that just really made me think. And yeah, it it seems as if that BSV is going to dominate because I'm trying to do a thought experiment of okay the value of all crypto gets cut by 90% tomorrow. So do people still want BTC? Do people still want BSV? And I think people will still want to play with BSV and still do things because it, people are uploading real video and like making all these cool apps. But if the value of Bitcoin gets cut by 99% tomorrow, who's playing around with BTC? I see what you're saying. Okay, so this is new. If the value in terms of dollars yes. were to drop for both uh, for all crypto across 99 the board, 99% tomorrow. Yeah, to almost worthlessness. Yeah. BTC's value proposition is as a medium of exchange between fiats mm -hmm. and so it loses almost all of its utility in that area yeah. but BSV's utility is less about uh, exchange to fiat mm -hmm. and more about running machinery right. and, and running programs mm -hmm. and storing data so it does not use it lose its utility to the users if the price drops. Maybe if the network still runs as expected with the ninety nine percent price drop, because the miners could just go offline and mm. not store data. So I think that's an unanswered question. Or perhaps um, the people who value the data storage um, would prevent the price from decreasing too much because their their demand is high enough and the supply is low enough to keep the price stable despite a drop in prices for other coins. Does that make sense? Yeah, but let's say you just uh, paid one BSV to store an HD video on on the blockchain. Yeah. And so let's say the miner accepted $100 in value to do that because that's the price of a PSV. Yeah. So what if the price drops 99%? And so now, you know, you uploaded yesterday and the miner thought, like, okay, I'll store this for $100. But now the price has dropped one to $1. The miner could say, yeah, it's not worth my time. I'm not storing this anymore. Um, yeah, if there's a market for fees, though, the user would presumably oh, have to pay like a hundred BSV to store the same data now, right? Right. So but that may past data. Past it, yeah, data. Yeah, it's already uploaded. It was uploaded when the price was a hundred dollars. Now the price is a dollar. Yeah. So I guess. But I it's, guess they it's could charge. Yeah. It's done though, right? I mean, it's already in the blockchain, so it's it's paid for. Right, but data persistence. It costs money to you know serve that data. Hmm. Well, if I were storing that data, wouldn't I just charge more for future storage? Right. Yeah, for future storage, but for past storage. You could just say, like... That has already been paid for. Right. It's been paid for to get into the chain, but it, it's not paid for to be served to you, to be provided. Like, so it's in the chain, but you can just prune all of the data from the op return. And, like, you don't need to store all of the data. Hmm. I guess the idea behind that is that there'll be data providers that aren't necessarily miners that store the chain and serve the data for as a service. Oh, okay. So like yeah. I you can like pay 
you can pay Comcast of blockchain to pull the data from the blockchain and serve you. I love that. I mean, that makes a lot of sense to me. Why should the miners be the same ones yeah. doing the serving? Well, miners are incentivized to do that because they have the data anyway. Right. But it's not a requirement. You don't need to be mining blocks in order to serve the data. Yeah. And I guess there's more chance to specialize if you're a data provider and you don't have to worry about, you know, mining. Right. Yeah, that would be a huge benefit to be able to specialize in that area. Well, I, I think I see what you're saying is that um, according to Mises and the definition of money as a medium of exchange, that at one point is the most tradable good, BSV is more attractive than BTC because it has more value to the user outside of exchange for fiat. It can right. store data and no one's really doing that with BTC. Right, there's no use for it if the price goes to $1. No one's going to use Bitcoin. I was using Bitcoin when it was very low, you know, like mm -hmm. when it had, had very little price and I wasn't expecting it to go higher. The utility for me at the time was that it was an alternative to the dollar, mm -hmm. but there are now many alternatives to the dollar, so it's not m better. All other things being equal, I would prefer to use BSV because I, I perceive that I can do more with it. Maybe right. I'm wrong, though, because yeah. I can exchange more goods and services against BTC. Mm-hmm. Like, there's things, uh, there's, like, cards where you can, like, swipe a card and pay with gold. Like yeah. the equivalent of gold. Or, or Bitcoin. Yeah, or Bitcoin. Yeah. Those. But, so, that'd be, like, one of the alternatives that, you know, you could use instead of using the dollar. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I used to. Yeah, I used yeah. to use, like, silver and stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, that that's really interesting. Thanks for pulling out that um, segment. What do you say we try and finish up this chapter with this yeah. these questions? So eight. The anticipation of expected changes in purchasing power. Is the purchasing power of the immediate past the basis of all judgments concerning money? What is the role of the anticipation of these changes? The purchasing power of the immediate past is are also known as current prices. The, the basis of all judgments concerning money. I'd say no, because of the the regression theorem. It's not the basis. The basis would be the very first time that that object was used as money. The immediate the immediate past does play a role, but the basis, the foundation, is traced back to the moment when it was first used as a medium of exchange. Yeah, all, and not only that, everything in between. So there was all this uh, time when the money was more or less valuable and that it could be exchanged for more or fewer goods. Uh, so what is the role of the anticipation of these changes? Well, people expect changes in purchasing power all the time. I see toilet paper on sale, okay, hey, that's a low price, I'm gonna buy a lot of toilet paper right now, or oh, hey, um, ice cream is, you know, $10 a gallon, wow, that's too much, I'm not gonna buy ice, I'm gonna, with, wh what's the term, set aside, <laughs> or whatever Misu says, um, there's some, some term he uses in, uh, like, choosing or setting aside, I guess. So, I, per, I expect changes in purchasing power all the time, and so, and, and so does everyone else. And it's always changing for goods and for money, because the, the quantities of all these things are changing, and the demand and supply of all these things are changing, so, right. yeah. What is the role for the anticipation of these changes? Um, 
in, in helping humans decide what to buy at what time. Mm-hmm. What were the causes of the flight into real goods or crack up boom? Oh, it's when everyone perceives that the inflation is, is getting carried away, that their money today won't be uh, a, or their money tomorrow won't be able to purchase what it is able to purchase today, and so they'll buy anything with it. Right. I saw that in um, Argentina. It's crazy that people are just like, I'll buy it. I'll buy anything. I'll buy whatever oh, I really? can. Yeah, they're, they're like, they know that their money is not going to be worth what it is the sa- the next day. Not that the money is is that bad in Argentina. That the inflation rate was, I think, 30% when we were there. And that's year. annually. Yeah. Which is pretty bad. That's crazy. So they just, they don't save money. They... And, well, they don't save cash. Why would they? Why would they save money? It's horrible. It's a horrible idea. So they buy, if they have money, they buy property in Uruguay. And all these properties sit vacant. Because it's at least they can have that property. Yeah, it's really weird. I think the government thinks that if they devalue the money or print more of it, first of all, it's good for them because they can spend it, but then secondly, it will uh, be good for the economy because more people are spending money. But it's um, all misallocation of resources because if I'm buying something that I don't need and it's not really useful to me and I'm only buying it because my money won't be able to buy anything tomorrow, that's, that's really shitty. Um, I'm buying things that I shouldn't, that I can't use. Hmm. Wow. That's a unique perspective. Like, I've never thought about that. Just because where I live, it's not an issue, really. People people want cash. Yeah. Well, you would, if, if our money was more inflationary, or if more people perceived the money was inf- inflationary, more people would be buying things like cigarettes and rum or whatever you can trade later mm. as a medium of exchange that will retain its purchasing power because so, the money won't. Right. So it sounds like for more people to want to use crypto, the perception needs to be that your money's being inflated. I think so, yeah. And then, don't even mention, you know, Bitcoin or anything. If it's in their head that they're just trying to get rid of their money, they'll just, they'll find crypto, like, on their own. They'll move into goods that they yeah. perceive they can, that will be more, they'll be liquid. Yeah. They can... Right, so first they might try rum and cigarettes, and then they'll, like, oh, wait, what about this Bitcoin? Yeah, it's a lot easier to store mm-hmm. for some for some people. Um, what is the failure of mathematical economics with regard to this phenomenon? Oh, well, it's that um, money and monetary policy can be wildly inflationary by the numbers. But if people don't perceive the inflation, um, if they're not cognizant about it, then it's irrelevant. It's only when humans actually believe that the money is inflationary that the problem occurs, because then that's when their human action changes to to start buying goods and um, oh, man. goods instead of the yeah. So it's always human psychology. Yeah. So maybe I think that's maybe where we might be at with the dollar. People aren't perceiving that there's inflation because they hide it, but you know. It's like staring people in the face with like healthcare and like college tuition costs and like property value and stock market value and wages, li- and minimum wages, and how how people are struggling to live on right s- such a small amount. But you know you can still buy like a hot dog for a dollar, so that's how they hide it, or like yeah they still like they they can still like keep the price of like certain things down, so they hide it a little bit yeah yeah so uh, I agree with you it seems that people don't perceive inflation Mm. right in America 
What are the different stages of the inflationary process? I think we kind of talked about it. Well, there's the expansion of um, money supply. Money supply, right? And, and then the, the people who get it first are beneficiaries because they get to spend it before it's, uh, the money's circulated. Right. And uh, before there's any perceived. Yeah. Uh, before there's any perceived inflation. Right. And, and then some goods and services rise first. Mm -hmm. Because that the new money touches it first. Yeah, well not only that, there's probably certain goods that are more valuable to people that they will they'll buy first, mm -hmm. like uh, capital goods mm -hmm. or, or uh, luxury goods, and then later on the, the, the things that don't increase in price as much, like hot dogs or whatever, mm -hmm. like their price is almost unaffected by the inflation. Right. Um, and then, presumably, this process repeats until people perceive the inflation. They move into goods, a crack-up boom occurs, and the money becomes useless, and they have to start all over again. Nine, the specific value of money. What are commodity and credit money? So, commodity money is money that's based on commodity. So, gold is commodity money, silver, Commodity money. Would you say Bitcoin is commodity money? No, because what? a commodity, say it's ledger money. Uh, a commodity is a something that people want, like a, or something that people use, right? I don't know. I'm asking a, a sincere question without um, an expectation of an answer. I, I'm uncertain whether it's commodity or credit money, but I'm leaning towards commodity money. I would say that it's it represents a unit of electricity. Mm. Um, so a commodity's definition is a raw material or primary ar agriculture product that can be bought and sold, such as copper or coffee. So yeah, if you want to say the it, not necessarily. I'd say it's the work. Mm, right. So I guess it's the most abstract commodity there is. It's like, uh, it's work. It's, yeah, com computational work. Mm -hmm. It can be performed by a human. Yeah, not necessarily computational. It's, it's work. Well, it's not digging holes in the ground. It's doing mathemat mathematical it's, problem solving, right? Like, yeah, but the, the definition of like work in physics. Ah, uh, okay, yeah. It's the a, it's a physics definition of work. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. It it couldn't be credit money because credit money can be created at will, uh, ad infinitum, right? Like a bank can create credit money. Right. Yeah. Um, and Bitcoin isn't like that. It has a hard limit. Mhm. Mm yeah, I'd say credit money is like it, like an IOU. Would be credit money. Yeah. Like if you know, you did something for me and I didn't give you. Silver for it, I gave you a promise to do something or an IOU, then yeah. I'd be giving you credit money. Or banknotes from the bank of Brandon, you yeah. know, like. Exactly. Okay, why can't we make assertions about the size of somebody's cash holding by considering a man's material situation? Well, we don't know the value he places on cash. Like, for instance, so uh, a rich man in Argentina may have zero cash holdings. Right. <laughs> yeah. He might have just a ton of Uruguayan properties. Right. Maybe it was earlier or later in this chapter, but I, I, maybe it was exactly this point where Mises says that um, when people mistake... When people say that, um, oh, a, a man's desire for cash is unlimited, uh, that's not exactly accurate, because it's what they mean to say is that a man's desire for wealth is unlimited. Mm -hmm. It can never be satisfied, or, but 
demand for cash can certainly be satisfied. You can have put too much cash. Yeah. Like, I don't want all this cash. I want to buy things with it now. Like, mm-hmm. new cash comes in, I'm buying a yacht. Like, right. I don't need all this cash on hand. Ten. The import of the money relation. Can producers be in distress because of a scarcity of money? No. No such thing as a scarcity of money. Right. Any quantity will do. And... Um, prices will adjust. Not necessarily. If you this, like, if you take it to the extreme and you say, "Okay, our money is this one rock," yeah, then like it only has a unit of one or zero. So if it's not divisible, okay, but that yeah, it's kind of well, a yeah. Crazy situation. That is a crazy situation. I'm trying to look at it from all perspectives. Can producers be in distress because of a scarcity of money? I don't think so. I think you, you hit it like, you know, the money's just more valuable. Like if it's scarce, then there's only uh, a million bitcoins to go around now. Like producers aren't stress because okay now the bitcoin those bitcoins are just worth more yeah i don't think it i think it's a trick question and like money will like so if there's a scarcity of money then money new money will evolve like let's say we only had this one rock yeah we'd be we'd like we need a okay new money. let's yeah let's find a different medium of exchange i think the trick question is if if you replace the word money with like lumber or some other commodity well then the answer would be yes okay. producers can be in distress because of scarcity of raw materials Mm -hmm. but money is unique in that you can have as little quantity of it as anything and and it's fine what are the consequences of an inflationary policy generally a rise in prices Mm -hmm. and misallocation of resources yeah I'd say globally it's just they're like on a macro it's violence because it creates a um, wealth disparity between the the people who produce the money and get the money first to the people that touch it last. So it creates an, a wealth disparity. And whenever there's a big enough wealth disparity, the people at the bottom tend to revolt against the people at the top. Mm. And I think that's kind of where most of the wars come from at least in like the 20th century when like the Germans money like the mark got inflated away like it that set the stage for like Hitler to come up because their money was worth nothing and you know few there's just a bunch of people rich all around the world hmm so inflationary policy is destructive Mm -hmm. to the economy uh, because it leads to misallocation of resources and a widening of the uh, wealth gap, Mm -hmm. for lack of a better term. Yeah, it seems to end in destruction. But a deflationary policy seems um, to have little or no effect, uh, no, no detrimental effects. Deflationary policy means that prices will decrease, but other than that, it doesn't seem to have any like yeah. Because eventually, effects. people need things. Like you can't just like you, like you like you said, you can have too much money. Like if it's so deflationary, like yeah, you're holding like ooh, this Bitcoin's gonna go to the moon, but eventually, you know, you want to you need to buy things with it. Yeah. 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 The money substitutes. What are money substitutes? Things that are just as good as money. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, I don't know, what's an example? A Federal Reserve note. <laughs> <laughs> it, um, a money substitute. Cigarettes, I guess. Yeah. I don't know. Well, I guess in that case it is money. Yeah, I don't know many things that we use as... Oh, oh, I know. What do we use as, as money substitutes every day? 
credit card money. Oh, that's okay. not that's not uh, commodity money. It's not backed by anything. It's new credit money, but it's just as good as a dollar that I can hand someone. What is the definition of a money certificate? So I guess that would be a dollar. Yeah, I I should think a money certificate is something that could be exchanged for the money. Right. So if it's like a bank note mm -hmm. or a Federal Reserve note in this case, it could be redeemed for the actual money, which would be gold and silver at the time of the writing, but mm -hmm. that's not true anymore. What does fiduciary media mean? Not sure. I know the word fiduciary when it comes to like fiduciary responsibility. Mm hmm And you know, that would be you know, if you have someone's money or you're in charge of it, you have a responsibility to be smart with it and to do the right thing. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh and media is related to the word medium, as in medium of exchange. It's the plural, so it would be like Fiduciary media is probably all the things that can be used as money. I think. I'm going to see if there's a clearer definition in the summary. Oh, okay. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, fiduciary media consists of the proportion of perfect money substitutes, which is a bank issues, which a bank issues, but does not fully back by physical monetary units. Ah, uh, okay i.e. gold or paper money in their vaults. Fiduciary media can exist in many forms, including credit, notes, checks, or drafts. Right. They're not backed by anything necessarily. Right. If, if so I that, may... I guess that would be a money substitute, too. It's... So like your credit card is a money substitute because it's not necessarily backed by dollars in the bank. I, I think the two are two distinct separate um, concepts. One is redeemable and one is not. So if I may, um, the summary of this chapter is pretty short. I'll just read it. Um, the money substitutes. If there is a claim to a definite amount of money, payable and redeemable on demand, such that no one doubts the solvency of the debtor, then this claim performs all the services of money and becomes a money substitute. Typical examples are banknotes and bank deposits subject to check. If the debtor, such as a bank, has kept a reserve of money proper to back up the money substitutes that it has issued, the claims are called money certificates. However, if the debtor has issued more money substitutes than it can redeem with money proper, then the unbacked portion of the claims become fiduciary media. So unbacked money substitutes. I guess they're both money substitutes, but money certificates are backed up, fiduciary media are not. Okay. I think we hit most of them. Um, so commodity, what would commodity credit be? It'd be, you know, credit based on commodity. Okay. Yeah, I think it's pretty straightforward. Yeah. What, I guess uh, an example would be like um, this is this uh, note is good for 10 grams of gold mm -hmm. rather than this note is good for $10, you know? Right. It's for a commodity or t 10 ounces of weed or whatever. What is the definition of circulation credit? I don't know. I don't know that one, and it wasn't in the summary. Yeah. Um, Excuse me.
the next one looks good. Let's go to 12 just because yeah. we have a lot to get to. Yeah. The limitation of the issue of fiduciary media. How is the confidence important with regard to fiduciary media? So it, we need the confidence that the de debtor is solvent. Right. Because like they're unbacked. Right. I'm not going to take your money if I think you're bankrupt. You're, I'm not going to take your promise if I don't think you're going to follow through. Yeah. And it probably um, reduces its value if, if people are not confident in, if you give me a bank note for the, the Bank of Brandon, I'm going to treat that, that's going to trade it lower than market, uh, lower than face value. Yeah. Um, $10 of the Bank of Brandon might be only $5 if I'm trying to pass it off to someone else. Uh-huh. What is the main argument for each independent bank to issue its own notes? So all of the banks will compete to have their notes be the best. Like, you know, if everyone has their own bank note, but like, you know, the market will see like, hey, these branded notes are crap. I don't want them. So it introduces competition into like the bank notes. And furthermore, if there is competition among banks to issue their own notes, nobody will accept privately issued banknotes, presumably, because um, none of them will be able to be trusted and everyone will move into commodity money. Didn't uh, Mises make that point about free banking and how there are some people who are like, hey, I'm against all this fraud, so let everyone who wants to make their own banknote, there will be a ton of fraud, and everyone will reject this system in favor of something more honest, like commodity money. Mm -hmm. What were the consequences of the laws that compelled banks to keep a reserve in a definite ratio of the total amounts of deposits and of banknotes issued? Do you remember this? I do not. Um, so, I mean, the consequence, so I guess the consequences, it's the, the compelled banks to keep reserve. Not sure. So is this? So this is talking about the time before the dollar when banks issued their own notes. No, I think this is a, a description of what we have today. Um, banks are compelled to keep a ten percent reserve rate. Right. Um, and I think that has recently changed so that um, they, they don't even need to keep that. Oh, really? Yeah, that changed like this year. Oh. Um, if, if they have a relationship, something like, if they have a, a relationship with the Federal Reserve or they, if they have, um, if, if they have a, a credit with the local Federal Reserve Bank with mm -hmm. which they do business, that counts as a reserve. Wow. at their bank <laughs> yeah yeah well it's interesting it um yeah i mean so that just that leads to the creation of more money because you know when people deposit a hundred dollars in their bank account they have a hundred dollars in their bank account but also the bank is out lending 90 percent plus of that money as right. credit which just creates more money Ah, so maybe you hit on the answer here. If um, if a, if banks were not compelled to keep a reserve in a definite ratio, then there would be a market um, rate for credit affected by that uh, 
on a day to day basis, like, oh, well, we need to keep this much of a ratio, or yeah, we need to but keep that much. There's no banks out there that say, hey, we're going to keep 100% of your dollars. Like, it's not a concern. Like, you, people don't right. shop banks based on their reserve ratio. No, they, I suppose they don't. Which is a consequence of, you know, the Federal Reserve. Um, I think in, in instead of a asking and answering these questions, uh, I might benefit more from reading the mini section aloud, if that's okay with yeah. you. Um, the limitation on the issuance of fiduciary media. A bank or government naturally has the incentive to issue fiduciary media, but there are limits. If the issuance proceeds so rapidly that the public becomes suspicious, they will turn in the claims and demand redemption in actual money. In a competitive market, the limits are even narrower. A single bank will only enjoy a subset of the population as its clients. Anyone who receives its banknotes will not add them to, the, to cash balances. Therefore, a bank that unilaterally inflated its issuance of fiduciary media would quickly find these excess notes returning for redemption. Observations on the discussions concerning free banking. All of the alleged horrors that would occur under unregulated banking are in fact due to government privileges that relieve certain banks from their contractual obligations. Ah, right. When, without government protection, in the form of bank holidays, etc., irresponsible banks would be subject to runs and would go bankrupt. Um, a cartel of private banks expanding in unison is nonsense. The banks with better reputations would not join the others. Moreover, the entire aim of the government in banking has been to cartelize the industry and promote credit expansion in order to lower interest rates that would not occur in a free market. So I think the consequence of the laws that compelled banks to keep a uh, reserve in a definite ratio um, has been to expand the money supply beyond what the market would bear. Mm -hmm. Right. The size and composition of cash holdings. In what way does the employment of money substitutes that are not used aboard fuel the emergence of a surplus? What does surplus mean in this context? So, I guess, if it's not used abroad, the money stays in the economy, which creates this surplus. I don't really know. So, if the money's never leaving, like, the economy, then it creates this expansion of money. Uh, so, I guess that's what it means. Uh, yeah, I should think so. So, like, um, in Argentina, the money is really bad, and no one uses um, Argentinian money here in the U.S. So, uh, in what ways does the employment of money substitutes that are not used abroad fuel the emergence of the surplus? Well, there's a lot more Argentinian money that stays there, and it, it becomes a surplus of the money. Right. Um and a surplus in this context means, you know, more than um, the economy n needs to fulfill all its, its uh, desires. Mm -hmm. In what cases does a surplus go abroad? Well, when the, um, 
money is is more valuable in the foreign economy. For example, I can go to Canada or Mexico mm -hmm. and use U.S. dollars, and they will be accepted. Um, so sometimes a surplus can go abroad. And what is Gresham's law? People will use the their worst money first. Yeah. Oh, you'll take these Argentinian <laughs> notes. Great. Here, have those, please. Yeah. I'll keep the I'll keep the gold or whatever. Balances of payments. What is the definition of a balance of payments? What information does a balance of payments convey? In what way is the size of the group under consideration important? I'm not sure. I remember this. The balance of payments is the record of the money equivalent of the incomings and outgoings of an individual or group during a specific period of time. The credit side and the debit side are necessarily equal. The balance of payments is always in balance. The modern view that a net outflow of money reflects a negative balance of trade is due to mercantilist prejudices. The modern view that a net outflow of money reflects a negative balance of trade is due to mercantilism. So that's like when Trump says, "Like, oh, the, 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 um, the Chinese—they're taking advantage of us. There's a net outflow of money from the U.S. to China." That's wrong, though, because we're getting all their stuff, and we're. We're giving them, we're selling them bonds, and so we're we're printing money to get physical goods. Like we're the beneficiaries. Right. So I I perceive uh, this is an apt ex modern example. So he says the modern view that a net outflow of money reflects a negative balance of trade is is due to mercantilist prejudices, but. Is, is not correct. Mm -hmm. A trade deficit is not an unforeseen calamity that strikes a nation, but rather the cumulative outcome of deliberate transactions undertaken by each individual within the nation. Like, I'm buying a bunch of products from China. There's no, like, mm -hmm. any bigger thing directing that. No one worries that the residents of New York might foolishly spend all of their money on wares from the other states. The situation is more complicated when other countries or foreign currencies are involved, but the principle is the same. 15. Interlogical exchange rates. A comment. As a rule, commodities move only in one direction, but money is shipped now this way. Now that. Strange. Um, why does it make no difference whether the cities concerned belong to the same sovereign nation or to... Am I reading that? Right. Yeah. Why does it make no difference whether the cities concerned belong to the same sovereign nation or to different sovereign nations? What is the role of shipping costs within the frame of these transactions? Oh, yeah. Um, so you can only have arbitrage to the point where, um, the cost of shipping the money, um, equals the arbitrage opportunity. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if you can buy a Bitcoin for, um, $10,000 from the Seacoast rep, or $9,000 or $9,950 from Manchester will it better cost you less than $50 to get to Manchester or it's not worth it right how has the government 
interference sharpen the difference between domestic players and payment domestic payment and payment abroad so with regulations and laws they've created more friction when going through the the banking system they've created come again how has the government interference sharpened the difference between domestic payment and payment abroad? It's a lot easier for me to send money from my bank account to your U.S. bank account. It's a lot harder for me to send money from my U.S. bank account to an Argentinian bank account. Right, okay, yeah. What is the purchasing power parity theory? Why does mutual exchange ratio between various kinds of money tend to a final state? I don't know this. Well, I would think that um, if you're looking at the Forex market, something like um, Argentinian notes are always going to be worth less than dollars, and um, yen and yuan and like certain things euros or, or pound sterling is always going to be worth more relative to other currencies and it doesn't matter if you go through dollars first or through yen first or you pass in between something it seems like the mutual exchange ratio between various kinds of money tends to a final state Purchasing power parity. I would say at an instant. Though. Yeah, yeah. Like a snapshot in time. Whether, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because arbitrage basically. So you know, if you, like ten thousand dollars buys a bitcoin, and then like eight thousand euros buys a bitcoin, and then the ratio between dollar and euro is like one point five, like they're gonna. Through arbitrage, all three of those prices are going to be in agreement. Eventually. Right. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Who benefits from dealing with the differences in exchange ratios? Arbitragers. Yeah. The heroes. Interest rates and the money relation. Well, it's 10 o'clock. I'm going to have to start the yeah. meeting. So mm, let's try and finish this. The next time we meet.